Hi, this is Roger from Kanka Labs with part three of our component tester shootout of four different models. Um, this time we take a look at the uh, special functions um, because each, except for the, DC, the Peak Atlas DCA55, which has no special functions, uh, the cheapest model of, uh, of the Peak Atlas one, uh, the other three, they all have their uh, specialties, uh, like uh, the uh, FISH 8840, which we have in our shop, which can also me measure uh, resistors, inductors and capacitors, or uh, the, uh, well, we'll see uh, in a minute uh, what they all can uh, do else. And we'll take, uh, tear down all of the four uh, to take a look inside if we find anything interesting, uh, perhaps something about the measurement principle, uh, if they are not open source like the Peak Atlas ones. And uh, as a surprise or as an addendum, I found out how to self-calibrate uh, the, uh, the FISH 8840 and even a possibility perhaps how to improve the accuracy of this one from about 3% to 1% with a uh, precision reference uh, that can be built in but that um, well just wait a few minutes so let's start go to the lab bench and um, demonstrate the special function now let's start uh, with our favorite uh, or somewhat favorite the FISH 8840. First of all, you will notice um, I've attached uh, these three test leads with the mini grabber um, test clips. Uh, we have decided here at Kanka Labs just uh, the parts that you buy from us. Uh, they get these um, hand soldered test clips for free as an addition because I think it's uh, quite a good idea to have uh, two ways of connecting um, um, devices under test, just as with the AS4002, where you can use the pin header or the three uh, little mini grabber test clips. So, uh, second thing is. Um, when carefully reading the German manual from the original uh, author, um, I noticed uh, there is a self-test or better self-calibration um, option. And this is activated by before starting the tester by connecting all three um, test ports uh, together, just to short them out. You can do this either uh, here with uh, putting some wire bridges from one to two, two to three, and um, one to three, or just use the uh, mini grabber test clips and shorten them out and now let's see what happens when we now switch oops sorry when we now switch on the tester after measuring ah it displays self test mode it first of all measures the uh, resistance uh, of the test leads the internal reference voltage Let's continue now. There are a few. Uh, it makes all connections, all possible connections to measure uh, the uh, internal resistors uh, that are sequentially connected. And the values you can see here are the differences in millivolts. And they should be in the range between zero and a few millivolts. Now it says in self-test mode, um, option number five to release the probes which we do now and it goes on now with the uh, open uh, circuit to measure uh, the offset voltages we are always in the range of just a few millivolts and that's millivolts and that's okay and now we come finally to it measures the internal capacitance and now we shall connect a capacitor greater than 100 nanofarads 
uh, between um, pin one and three, which is here the green and the blue LED. So I've taken a one microfarad um, plastic film capacitor. So uh, that way uh, it can measure or improve the accuracy in um, <clears throat> capacitance testing. Self-test and that was it. There are, if you carefully read the, um, ah, now we already can see uh, it, it immediately went into test mode and we already can see the results from this uh, test capacitor. Um, there are a lot of software switches that can be set or not set. Um, I can't go into every detail, uh, but at the end of, um, uh, of our test here, I will give you still some hints uh, what can be improved and what can be test by using your, using your own version of the firmware. Now, let's start with uh, resistance measurements. And um, the manual states that it can measure from 0.1 ohms to around 50 mega ohms. Now, let's start with a 10 ohms 1% resistor and see what we get as a result. And we get 1.00 ohms. Now, um, to tell you just uh, what we will discuss later a bit, uh, this Chinese version does not have a 1% um, external reference, which is uh, advised to be used from the original author. Anyway, we here have now, we're inside the 1% accuracy of the resistor itself. Now let's go over to, so we don't compare this with an expensive uh, multimeter because 1% accuracy, I think, uh, fits within the range of the initial accuracy of the resistor, it will be okay. Now we take something in the middle with uh, one kilo ohms. Let's see what we get. And we get 999.0 ohms, uh, which is absolutely within the 1% uh, accuracy of the resistor. And I think that's really astonishing how they achieve it um, because they are only using the internal reference of the 80 mega. And if you look in the data sheet of the 80 mega, uh, it is stated that uh, the internal reference only has 10% accuracy uh, at max. And my experience is that uh, they in reality are around 3%. So I don't know if it's just a chance result that we get 1% accuracy uh, displayed here. Now let's go to the higher end and now I've put in a 10 mega ohm 1% metal film resistor and I'm really, I haven't tried out this before, 10 point, so it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, we only get a 1% difference. So that's really in the, I would say in the noise absolutely astonishing how accurate this little beast is. So that was um, really, really on the good side. Um, it really can replace a simple multimeter or serve if you don't have one with you. It can serve as um, an uh, extra ohms meter. And now we make a little break because the capacitance and inductance um, test modes, I will compare the result with, uh, with our LCR meter here, which has around 1% or better accuracy. And uh, as you know, you usually don't get inductances, uh, inductors or uh, capacitors better than 1%. So we cannot rely on the 
on the uh, stated value. So we have to compare the results with, a, with an accurate LCR meter. But, uh, well, I'm very, very surprised about the accuracy of uh, the FISH 8840. So, next is capacitor uh, measurement. I've tried to adjust the height of the two displays uh, of the uh, reference uh, or our reference LCR meter, the medium priced uh, Mastec MS5308 and the FISH. And uh, the measurement range that is stated from the manual goes from 35 picofarad. Uh, up to 100 millifarad or 100,000 microfarads. And uh, let's start with a 100 picofarad capacitor, which you can see here, a little ceramic one. And we get a uh, value of 96 picofarad. And what's stated here as V loss. Um, this is a special function. Um, the voltage at the capacitor is measured twice. First of all, it is charged with a, let's call it a charging pulse. Then the voltage is measured immediately after the uh, charge pulse. And then it is weighted uh, some time, a few, I don't know, a few dozen milliseconds, and then the voltage is measured twice. Of course, a good capacitor should give exactly the same voltage, which would mean V loss is zero, as we see here, that there is no voltage loss uh, after waiting for a few or a few dozen milliseconds. But uh, especially electrolytic capacitors and or paper capacitors, and especially if they are somewhat older, um, uh, they will ha develop a uh, voltage drop after the initial uh, charging. And this will be displayed here. Perhaps we can see it later with a bigger electrolytic. Now let's compare this result of 96 picofarad with what the LCR meter tells us. I'm sorry you can't see how I connect the Kelvin clips. And let's go out from... So we get 98 picofarad at 100 kilohertz uh, measurement frequency. Um, so this is only two picofarads off and again a astonishingly accurate, a 2 picofarad offset could also be due to the measurement frequency. I've uh, used here the default value of 1 kilohertz. So uh, when measuring capacitors and inductors, as we will do later, you cannot always directly compare and say uh, if, the, if a possible uh, difference in the values is really a measurement error or it's, uh, it's due to a different measurement voltage or due to different measurement frequency. So this result is extremely good for, uh, for an initial test. Now let's go some decades up and uh, use this one microfarad um, film capacitor and just fiddling around a bit again to connect it and let's see what we get now. Battery okay and we get now we get even three values. Um, the uh, measured capacitance is 987. We get a 0.1% loss. Let's repeat this and see if we get the same result. Because directly after connecting, yeah, we get the same result. Of course, that's also the last uh, digit here, so it could also be zero. And we get the ESR displayed. 
Um, although the manual states that the ESR measurement is very approximate, but let's compare this with the LCR meter. So we get 980, let's round it up, 988 uh, nanofarads and an ESR of 0.2 ohms, round it up. 900, now we have a little bit more, 980 nanofarads. And connecting it to the LCR meter, just a second. Yeah, we are, uh, with 985, we are only um, 6 nanofarads off, that's less than 1%. And let's see if we can, depending on the measurement frequency, if we can um, display the ears are. Well, I probably have to go up with the measurement frequency. Let's take 100 uh, kilohertz. And OK, we get the uh, dissipation factor. Uh, we could uh, calculate the ESR. I will give you the result later down in the comments, um, just not to uh, waste too much time now. Uh, now we get the quality factor. Now. Okay, here we have the ESR of 0.03 ohms. Now with 100, and you see the displayed value has changed with frequency, and that's, this is not due to uh, the inaccuracy of the LCR meter, but um, it's due to the um, due to the uh, changing capacity and changing ESR with frequency. Uh, that's something every uh, capacitor, more or less, uh, a property, uh, it's more or less pronounced. So we're um, here with 0.17 ohm. Well, uh, this is something in the milliohms range, the difference, and I can't, we can't tell if it's due to the different measurement frequency or it's a real deviation from the true value. Anyway, the basic value is was measured extremely uh, good with good accuracy. And let's try again just to show you the um, changing value with a frequency. So we'll uh, change the frequency from 100 kilohertz, where we have 956 nanofarads, down to 100 hertz, and we get 990. Uh, so you see, if we increase the frequency, we get a successively lower value, and that's typical for uh, capacitors which are not super high quality. Again, at 10 kilohertz, you see the continuously decreasing um, capacitance and the increasing uh, ESR. So next, let's take a large electrolytic of 4,700 microfarad. You can see here down below. Just have to adjust a little bit. The testing time now takes considerably longer, and the testing frequency is relatively low because it takes some time to charge up such a big electrolytic. And we get 5,633 microfarad. Now we see a, a V loss of nearly 1% which means after the t or between the two measurements, uh, there was a voltage drop of nearly 1%, uh, typical of electrolytics. This one also is a bit older, or better said, it hasn't been used for some time. 
Uh, and that's a typical behavior of um, electrolytics that haven't been used for uh, many years. They have to be reformed uh, again. The, uh, the boundary layer between the positive and the negative, or between the anode and cathode, has to be uh, reformed. Uh, and uh, that could be the reason also for this 1% uh, loss voltage. And we get an ESR of 0.13 uh, ohms, which seems to be in the reasonable range. And now let's compare this with our the measurement from our LCR meter. Again, take some time to connect the clips. And we have to, of course, go down in frequency to 100 hertz and we get 5.2 uh, or it varies a little bit 5.34 uh, millifarad that's essentially uh, the same as we got here so again surprisingly accurate the ESR is only displayed uh, up to 100 uh, milli ohms in the least significant digit. Let's see if we can crank this up if we get a higher measurement frequency. In this case one kilohertz, but now it's already out of range because the measurement range of the LCR meter is dependent on the measurement frequency. Uh, so um, we can't compare the ESR, but the manual states the author has made extensive comparisons to a high-end LCR meter and um, has detected that the... Um, okay, we could, of course, um, from the uh, display dissipation factor or the uh, quality factor, we could now... Uh, calculate the ESR. I will give you that in the comments if it's in the same range of the displayed ESR from the fish. Anyway, um, the author has made extensive uh, comparisons uh, between the, uh, well, he doesn't call it the fish 8840, he calls it just the uh, semiconductor tester. Uh, and um, he found uh, deviations of less than 10% in the ESR, which is also, again, very good for uh, such a cheap and uh, for such a cheap device. Um, it proves the cleverness of, uh, of the author how to implement the um, measurement algorithm. Um, so anyway, we can be uh, very content. It, the range of um, the measurable capacitors goes from 35 picofarads up to uh, 100 millifarad. I don't have a 100 millifarad capacitor at hand. So the biggest I could uh, quickly get was uh, this uh, 4700 microfarad, which as we saw is in fact uh, has uh, more capacity. Um, so anyway, very useful uh, as a capacitance uh, meter, as a second functionality. And now, finally, let's go to inductance measurement. So we finally still have the uh, inductance measurement. The stated range goes from 10 microhenry uh, up to 20 Henry um, and we'll start with the slowest possible value of 10 micro Henry. See what we get. And we get 0.01 millihenries, uh, which is exactly uh, 10 microhenries, but of course it's the least significant digit. So it's at least uh, the resolution, let's say the resolution is 10 microhenry. And additionally, we get the uh, DC resistance of 0.6 ohms. Now let's compare this 
with the result from the LCR meter. First of all at 1 kilohertz. And we get uh, a series resistance of 0.6 ohms. Now I probably have to change the uh, measurement frequency. Let's try again at 1 kilohertz. Uh, now we go up to, let's just take 100 kilohertz. And we get 9.2 micro Henry's as the, let's call it the true value. So that's absolutely within the accuracy of the uh, fish. Um, so first of all, very good how low it goes. Of course, it does not go in the nanohertz, nano um, Henry region. So let's, let's take as a second inductor a uh, 2.2 millihenry inductor and see what we get now. And it displays a 2.36 and a series, a DC resistance of 22.4 ohms. Let's remember this 2.36 millihenries. Now with the LCR meter, we get 2.19 millihenries at 100 kilohertz. Let's take one kilohertz measurement frequency and we get 2.2 so uh, within a few percent depending on the measurement frequency we get uh, the same uh, basically the same result again to show you that the value changes with uh, measurement frequency at 10 kilohertz we still get 2.2 at 100 kilohertz we get a little bit less than 2.2 and let's see if we still get a value with 100 hertz. Yeah, okay, the change was not so big uh, as with the capacitor uh, measurement. Let's see if we can manually get it again. Uh, well, all right. Um, we Anyway, we get uh, basically the same with result within the uh, stated accuracy of a few percent. So surprisingly accurate uh, for such a cheap and simple device. So now even before uh, we take it apart and take a look, well, not inside, but below the LCD and on the underside, I'll give you my final verdict. Uh, there was a reason why we took exactly this one into our shop. Um, because it's really the absolute best bang for buck. Um, the additional capabilities, uh, not only to measure semiconductors, but also uh, resistors, capacitors, and inductors with a surprising accuracy, even with some, some uh, parasitic properties. Uh, is really unique, uh, much more useful than, for example, the uh, capability to measure uh, linear voltage regu regulators at the DCA75. Uh, that really makes this little tester outstanding. Uh, the, the usability uh, is enhanced if you uh, do use these additional mini uh, test grabbers, um, which we, as I already told you, which we supply for free. Uh, you can, of course, solder them by yourself if you have. Uh, if you buy it from eBay or other sources and have them at hand. And, uh, well, um, I'm really, every time I use this little tester, I'm really surprised about the versatility. And uh, the graphic LCD really is a good uh, expansion to the original version, which uses a uh, one or two line uh, 16 character LCD. 
And uh, so now finally uh, let's um, take it apart and see what's inside. So just to speed up things a little bit, I've already taken out the four Phillips head screws here, which fix the LCD to four uh, plastic standoffs. Let's uh, take it out and it's uh, fixed or f uh, with a, uh, a little pin header uh, to the uh, base PCB. Uh, not very much to say about it. It's a standard uh, 128 by 64 points uh, backlighted LCD. Here you can see the backlight. On the back side we see the flat flex cable. Uh, the uh, LCD backlight is obviously uh, switched with this little transistor. And um, here on the side at the uh, connector. There are even the designations and it looks like uh, this is a, a serial LCD with either SPI or I squared C bus uh, control. But uh, not much to say about uh, the LCD. The interesting things comes of course at the main PCB here. And um, this is a little mod I, I made for myself. I'll explain later. Uh, we have apparently, this seems to be a kind of universal uh, PCB because here we can see also the pins for a standard character LCD. This is obviously intended for the contrast setting. And so uh, obviously uh, this, um, PCB can also be used with the standard uh, one or two line 16 character LCDs. Um, one interesting thing is on the back side. Here we have the 10 pin SPI programming uh, connector. Uh, so you can easily uh, program this uh, with, um, with a 10 pin header or reprogram it if you have the right firmware by yourself. Let's go back to the to the front side. And um, well, uh, we have uh, an 80 mega 328p. That is uh, the same you know from the Arduino. Probably you can't read, depending on the angle, uh, the markings. And um, because the original uh, version is a completely firmware. I've um, you can get the sorely only in German the whole manual, which consists of nearly 100 pages, with the uh, the full schematic. And um, uh, here you can see something interesting. In the original version, you have the um, the possibility either to use the internal reference of the 80 mega or what is suggested as a better alternative, a precision 2.5 volts uh, reference uh, diode. Uh, here they suggest the LT 1004 or 1004. Um, We'll just see in a minute. This was the mod I tried to make, but to use it, you have to set a software switch in the firmware. And anything else is uh, standard. We have a, uh, let's scroll over it piece by piece. Here we have the power supply, a standard linear 78L05 regulator. Uh, two switching transistors for uh, the um, LCD backlight. Uh, we have an um, auto power off uh, transistor. Uh, we have the test button. And that's basically concerning the power supply and the auto power off. Um, the standard quartz crystal, 8 or uh, 16 megahertz. Uh, you can also set software switches, which uh, crystal you're using. And uh, we have the ISP uh, programming connection. And 
uh, here we have the resistors uh, which are switched to the three uh, test points uh, depending on uh, which of the outputs is switched uh, on. And uh, it's also suggested to get the maximum uh, precision uh, to use 0.1% uh, resistors. I think that's a bit overkill if you use standard metal film 1% re uh, resistors. Uh, the accuracy in the end is determined by the uh, precision diode and by some parasitic losses. And um, I think 1% resistors are totally sufficient. Anyway, the original author also has um, taken a look at uh, one of the Chinese clones and he has had some criticism. For example, that the uh, PCB traces to the uh, test points were too thin and uh, that the uh, resistance of the traces even um, um, makes the precision uh, go down. But obviously this is an improved version. Here we can see the uh, traces are really sufficiently big. There was also some, some points the original author criticized about some capacitors not being present and um, some other capacitors being too small. So this, is, this has all been corrected, but in, in the version that you can buy from us or at other places, here is an unpopulated area. And this is where the uh, precision reference diode is intended uh, to go into. Um, in in uh, the version we got, uh, this was uh, not only the uh, reference diode was not connected, but also the um, current limiting resistor also was not populated. So I've resolded this with another compatible uh, reference diode. And sorryly, um, the software switch in the AT Mega is not set to recognize it. Uh, so th that would have been an easy method to improve the accuracy to uh, guaranteed one percent. Now we have uh, now the the precision is limited. Uh, by the tolerance of the internal reference. As I already told you, it's stated as 10 plus minus 10% max, but realistically uh, the uh, internal reference of the 80 megas is around 3% uh, typical accuracy. So anyway, um, a coworker uh, of ours um, thinks that he has seen in the very long thread in the German forum uh, at microcontroller.net that um, somebody has also published uh, the version for the graphical LCD. So if you really find that, then we of course can set the software switch to, uh, to the external precision reference. And in that case, um, we will immediately change uh, the version we sell without any additional um, costs uh, so that we, uh, for uh, use of the uh, external reference, and we will supply the 1% uh, uh, or better reference at no additional cost. But at the moment, uh, we have to deal with the way it is. Um, so um, watch our channel uh, or uh, look from time to time at our online shop if we uh, were able to find a firmware, an open source firmware uh, uh, with inclusion of the graphical uh, LCD. So the rest follows uh, exactly to the original circuit. Here we have the 78. LO5 a regulator with a little bit periphery. These are the precision uh, resi reference resistors. Uh, and uh, so you can compare it. Uh, it's exactly the original circuit shamelessly copied, but it's open source. So it's allowed to uh, copy. 
And uh, the only thing they have changed uh, is uh, using a graphical LCD. So that was it um, for a short look uh, at the innards and uh, I can't tell it often enough this is really uh, due to the very sophisticated firmware for, from the original author uh, Karl-Heinz Kübeler. Uh, is really outstanding in uh, in the uh, bang for back bang for buck ratio. So that was it for the Fish eighty eight forty, um, and now let's go on to the other uh, semiconductor testers. So the AS forty o two does have one special measurement function that uh, none of the other uh, component testers does have and you see I've built up a little additional uh, circuit with only three components a diode, um, an electrolytic capacitor and a resistor and you already can guess with this uh, six pin uh, IC fixture that it's probably for uh, measuring optocouplers and you can see here from the freely available uh, circuit um, that it's exactly for that for optocouplers. Um, you have to connect the uh, three uh, wires in a uh, special uh, order so it works only with um, this uh, connection of the uh, red, black and blue um, lead and uh, you can also buy this adapter uh, as a um, already uh, pre-built, um, well not kit, a, a completely built up um, adapter, but uh, I think it's a little bit too expensive because for these three components you can, everybody can build it by themselves. Now so let's switch it on and see what happens. And it did it or shortly displayed OP1 detected, which means that the text test fixture for optocouplers is automatically detected. And now let's um, put a standard CNY17 optocoupler inside, and we get three values displayed. CTR is the current transfer ratio, which means when we here have uh, 58 or 59 percent, which means that the output uh, current of the uh, open collector uh, output of the optocoupler is 58 percent of the input current through the internal infrared LED. And that it is an infrared LED that it is used in optocouplers, you can see here, because uh, this displays the voltage and the current are through the um, LED inside the optocoupler. And it's uh, absolutely clear that when you have only 1.08 or 09 volts, uh, generated um, over the LED. It must be an infrared LEDs because LEDs in the visible light have uh, higher voltages. And um, let's again explain the current transfer ratio. At the moment we have 2.71 milliamps flowing through the LED. And now the collector current of the phototransistor is 58% uh, of these 2.7 uh, milliamps, which means the collector current now is around, well, let's say 1.5 milliamps. And there are also optocouplers with a Darlington phototransistor. Um, so there you would get a current transfer ratios usually in the range 10 times higher or more. And uh, the measurement range goes from 1% to 600% percent current transfer ratio. So that was the only uh, special function of the AS4002 Pro Determinator. And now let's take a look what inside, what's inside 
and how it is working. So let's first take out the battery and we see we have uh, two Phillips head screws here on the right and one inside the battery case. And let's see if it all comes apart when we unscrew the three screws. I can't remember it because uh, it's just quite a while ago since I built this from a kit. And here we have the inarts. Um, we have uh, the we can see the LCD and probably the uh, processor here is a uh, PIC one. And um, well, let's see if we can see something more when we unscrew the LCD and take the whole thing out. So it was a little bit of fiddling around to get it uh, out of the case, out of the box, although uh, there were no more screws. Now what can we see before we take off the LCD? Um, we have uh, here a little trim port that's only for the contrast setting of the LCD. Of course the main controller it's a pick, I'm not sure uh, which type. Here we have the little standoff for the six pin header and um, they, they are simply stacked, three ones stacked above each other. Uh, it's quite nice because the, uh, the outside one um, is a wears out with time and uh, so you can uh, just exchange it in case of the contacts are no more reliable. Um, so uh, the LCD was um, secured with a two little or secured with uh, two st threaded standoffs. Um, so let's see what we have below when we take it off. Again, in front of the camera, a bit difficult. Let's wait until the camera gets into focus again. And now, um, the main secret is in these three uh, analog multiplexers. Uh, these are 74HC4052, which are uh, two or uh, dual uh, 4 to 1 analog multiplexers. Um, I will show you in a second the circuit di diagram. You can get the link to the circuit diagram and the uh, manual, etc. Uh, in the extensive Excel sheet uh, that uh, is stored on our download server. The link will be down below in the comments. So not much else to see, so it's quite a uh, miracle. Uh, ah, here, this little two pin header is for the auto calibration. So uh, when you connect the two pins and uh, switch the, um, uh, uh, the tester on, then uh, it determines the uh, internal resistance of the CMOS multiplexers just to uh, store this in EEPROM and to uh, take it into account for the measurements. And we will later see uh, all the other semiconductors uh, seem to have copied this uh, principle. Uh, because I've already taken a peek inside the other ones, uh, you will get a little bit surprised at one of uh, the other three testers. Uh, how similar the measurement principle is to this well, let's call it more or less original or the first one I knew of uh, with this measurement principle. So anyway, nothing else to see. We have the little uh, 78L05 5 volt voltage regulator. We have a little MOSFET for switching on and off the LCD backlight and the uh, 3.5 millimeter uh, connector for the three uh, test pins. And um, so the secret is, as in most of the testers, is of course inside the uh, is inside the controller. It's the firmware, and it's really astonishing how much you can do with uh, just a little um, passive, more or less passive periphery. Uh, we even don't need a quartz crystal. Uh, the uh, this one here works uh, simply 
with a um, R, with the internal RC oscillator. So uh, that was it for a look inside the Pro Determinator, and uh, now uh, let's finally uh, take a look at the circuit diagram. So here we can see how the inventor uh, Michel Valetschek how he did it apparently uh, more than uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, well, we have the power supply, nothing um, spectacular to say about this. We have the LCD with the contrast setting, the uh, little MOSFET for the backlight switch on and off. And we have the uh, processor, the microcontroller. And the magic happens here in this section. So apparently the, um, the analog multiplexers, they can switch, um, each one can switch one of these four resistors going from 100K, 10K, 1K down to 100 ohms to one of the outputs. And the output is, each of the outputs of the uh, multiplexers is connected to one of the three test pins. And, um, well, that's how it all is uh, done. And because it can do, this is a bidirectional multiplexer, therefore it's an analog multiplexer. So it can either switch a, a voltage when this pin is set high uh, through the uh, resistors uh, to the output pin, or uh, it can measure uh, in the reverse direction uh, just the, um, uh, the, the voltage um, and the second half of the multiplexer is paralleled here to the uh, Y inputs of the uh, second multiplexer. And this goes to, as you can see, analog in 0, analog in 1, analog in 3. So that's how it's done. It can uh, switch either a voltage to the output or it can and measure this output put behind the transistors, so thereby it can determine the uh, current through the resistor, and that way the current uh, to the uh, component. Uh, or uh, it can switch off this output, then uh, it's uh, simply measured without any load, uh, the output uh, at the component side. And because each output can be either high or lo low, it can or uh, set to the off state, uh, high impedance state, uh, thereby you can switch uh, anything between a positive voltage uh, through a load resistor, uh, a ground connection through a load resistor or a high impedance, uh, state to each of the three uh, test pins and at the same time measure um, the voltage at the uh, test pin. So that's the way how they do it uh, or how the author uh, has accomplished it uh, to be able to measure um, by switching around and uh, having an algorithm just to see what component is inside and what voltages and currents do we have. So that was a nice, um, uh, nice idea from the author. And I think the idea was even so ingenious that uh, some people might have copied the idea, but uh, I don't know how long it took him to program uh, to program the algorithm or to find out the algorithm uh, just to find out which component um, is connected to the three test leads. So what's my final verdict uh, about the AS4002? Well, I'm a little bit biased in my opinion. Uh, simply because this was uh, the first one that uh, that I uh, got. Uh, it was at that time uh, quite a lot of money uh, for me as um, a student still. And uh, well, but I'm I just love this thing because it's uh, it's compact. Um, it has a hard power off switch. Um, it has these uh, two ways of connecting 
your unknown component either with the little uh, mini grabber test hooks or just inserting them in the 2x3 uh, header and so I think um, the versatility is good enough for me but of course as I told you this opinion is a little bit biased. So that shall be it for the AS4002 at least a relatively reasonable value for money. So next up for a um, disassembling or tear down and a final verdict is the DCA 55. Um, we have uh, what I really don't like uh, and I already mentioned this three screws simply to change the battery uh, so they didn't take the effort just to make a separate uh, battery case and so here it comes apart and the not very cheap and not very usual um, 12 volt alkaline uh, battery. Um, what do we get? We have suspiciously again a pick and again three uh, CMOS analog multiplex multiplexers um, 74HC4052. So um, I would say they uh, copied uh, just the idea of the inventor of the AS4002 Pro Determinator and well they surely made their own uh, firmware but uh, well I don't think this thing is really worth uh, the price. Um, let's see if we see anything on the lower side. No, there's only the LCD, two push buttons and nothing more. And there will also be nothing more um, below uh, the LCD. Yeah, you we could here. There's nothing more in inside. And it doesn't have to be because we just have the three multiplexers. Uh, so a shameless copy, I would say, and with lower usability um, and uh, I must say I don't like this thing. Uh, it has no special functions um, so um, I think uh, this is not worth uh, to buy. Uh, we bought this uh, here for the lab as you can see just um, well uh, as a cheap trial and uh, it was uh, it didn't held up to the expectations I think it's too expensive not very versatile um, so I don't like it uh, and uh, therefore we'll finish the teardown and final verdict of the DCA 55 so let's see what the DCA75 Pro can measure that the others don't or aren't able to. Uh, first of all, it can measure voltage regulators, but there are some serious limitations. First of all, it can only measure up to around 8 volts, a regulated voltage. Uh, that's uh, probably because it only has 12 volts uh, generated inside with a switch mode power supply and it needs a little bit of overhead for the dropout voltage. I've tried it with a 78L09 and a 79L09, a positive and negative 9 volt 100 milliamps regulator and it doesn't recognize them. Uh, so 8 volts uh, seems to be really the highest um, voltage uh, that it can uh, detect for a regulator. Uh, next I've connected a simple 3.3 uh, volt linear regulator and let's see what we get on the display. After the usual wait waiting time we get a wrong result. It sh it says it's an NPN silicon bipolar junction transistor uh, with a uh, protection diode and that's of course uh, totally wrong. 
So already here we can see that uh, the usefulness of this voltage regulator test is very limited because now we don't know is it a false component, is it broken or is the tester not able uh, to correctly uh, test it. Uh, the manual says that um, if a voltage regulator is operated outside of its um, circuit, then uh, it, uh, the tester is not always able to correctly test it. And that's uh, apparently the case here with the 3.3 uh, volt regulator. Um, well, it's not the usual one, it's a uh, low dropout one, but that shouldn't uh, matter. Uh, so, um, two out of three tests did not go very well. Going above 8 volts uh, doesn't work and testing a, um, it's a TS, let me look it up with our magnifier. It's a TSC 2950 3.3 volts, uh, equivalent to the LM 2950. And if it cannot test this one, well, mm, I'm not very impressed. Now let's finally see if it can test a standard 5 volt regulator, a 78L05, and that if it doesn't do that, well, we can uh, get away with this uh, voltage regulator test function. And again, we get a wrong result. I've tried it before. There we got the right result. Let's uh, give him a second chance or look up if I uh, did use the wrong... No, it's a 5 volt regulator. And uh, let's try it again. And uh, if it doesn't get this, then uh, yeah, okay, let's get away with this. Uh, it even cannot test uh, correctly a 5 volt uh, standard regulator. Uh, to be correct, it was not in, in a 78L05, but again, the low dropout version, the LM2950. But, uh, well, this feature is, in my opinion, totally useless. If we get three wrongs out of three, um, then what, what do you want to do with this feature? So, that was really disappointing. Um, anyway, um, there is a second feature which I mentioned uh, even at the first episode which makes this one really unique and that is the curve tracing functions. When you connect it with a uh, mini or micro USB, I don't know, cable uh, to the PC, but we will not test this in this final uh, test episode uh, simply because uh, it only makes use if we compare the uh, curve tracer functions with, let's call them, real curve tracers to see how useful they are. Because all the other three testers do not have this feature. And so let's uh, make a, a separate video about transistor curve tracers. We have two additional ones here at the lab, an analog one. Uh, and a second USB connected one and that makes a real uh, mini shootout of uh, transistor curve tracers or let's better call them semiconductor curve tracers because any transistor curve tracer can of course also uh, trace diodes and usually also thyristors or SCRs as you might call them and triacs. So anyway, this feature was not very good, so let's uh, open it up, and see what's inside and give a final verdict. So, all right, before we take it apart, let's give it a final chance with a 78L05, which I just got out from uh, storage. And if it doesn't do that, uh, I would be very surprised. 
And oh, now we get the correct result, a voltage regulator. And again, we have to scroll to see what measurement values we get. We get an output voltage of 4.96 volts uh, with a quiescent current of 2.83 milliamps and a dropout voltage of 1.45 volts. Well, at least now we got a correct result. Um, so apparently it can only measure uh, standard regulators like the 7805 or 78. L05, no low dropout regulators, nothing higher than 8 volts. And well, this, this makes this feature, as I already said, quite useless because you can't rely on the result if you have a correct working, correctly working regulator, a broken one or something else. Now let's go over and take it apart. So again, we have these three unnecessary uh, Phillips head screws just to change the battery. At least this time it's not a unusual type of battery, but a standard uh, AAA uh, alkaline cell. And now we find a lot of, a lot more hardware uh, inside. Um, we have here the USB connector, the central processor, and I'll just make a break to identify the uh, single chips to tell you what they are. So let's take a closer look at the ICs. And um, one thing uh, that annoyed me a bit is if you look how they attached the battery, um, well, this spring here is still uh, okay, but here for the uh, positive uh, pole of the battery, they just soldered a wire to uh, the PCB uh, instead of um, using a, a pr an appropriate battery compartment. So also a little bit of bad design. It's probably due to the limited amount of space they have in their uh, case here. Um, the case is also used for a lot of other um, devices by Peak Atlas, but okay, we'll get away with it anyway. Uh, a little bit strange for such an expensive device. Now, um, the uninteresting part is this here. This is obviously the uh, power supply. Uh, with two uh, switch mode uh, power regulators. Um, why do we need two voltages? Well, one is uh, to generate 3.3 volt from this uh, AAA cell for the microcontroller and the USB connection. And we need a second one uh, with uh, the 12 volt uh, maximum uh, test voltages. Um, I tried to identify the two ICs that are responsible. This is uh, U1 and U2. U1 only uh, has a coded marking of CJKT and Google didn't give anything on uh, that. And the other one has 9B2T. Uh, also, I couldn't find anything with uh, Google with a quick search. Um, but anyway, uh, it shall be sufficient to know uh, here they generate uh, simply the 3.3 logic voltage and the 12 volt analog voltage. Now, um, the uh, microcontroller is a PIC 18F47J53, uh, with, which has a direct USB functionality inside. It has 128K of uh, flash memory. Uh, you uh, also need uh, that much space probably or simply for the graphic LCD, the uh, different uh, symbols that are displayed. And it does have a uh, 10 or 12 bit uh, 
ADC, analog to digital converter inputs. Uh, so that's how they reach the high resolution for their measurements, uh, because uh, you might know the simple Atmel controllers uh, used in the Arduino and uh, other devices, uh, the, the uh, standard 80 megas or 80 tiners, they only have 10-bit ADCs, uh, the PIC has 12-bit ADC resolution. And now here, this is the analog uh, part. Uh, one of the central parts is this here, an MCP4728, and that's a four-channel 12-bit um, DAC, digital to analog converter. Um, so that is um, the other, um, the other uh, testers we uh, looked at, uh, they only used the 5 volt digital voltage. So the other ones only have a single uh, test voltage of 5 volts. Uh, here they needed a, uh, a digital to analog converter uh, to step the um, the analog voltages, the analog test voltages, simply to get the functionality of the curve testing and a sufficient resolution. Uh, that's why they used uh, 12 bits. 12 bits gives you 4096 uh, steps. So this translate if we have 12 volt uh, input voltage. Uh, this translates to a bow, let me calculate it, it should be 3 millivolt uh, steps. So next here is a um, MCP6H04. That's an uh, op amp similar to the LM324. The difference it's, uh, is it works only to 16 volt, it's a CMOS uh, amp and it does have less than one millivolt uh, input offset. So apparently um, they are using, uh, as I uh, suspect, only two channels of the four channel uh, DAC, um, simply because uh, we only care at a three uh, terminal device, we only can uh, um, use two input voltages and measure uh, one output voltage, uh, so that's why they don't need all the four channels of the digital to analog converter. And uh, the um, quad op amp here is uh, simply used uh, obviously for buffering and uh, I didn't investigate all PCB traces, so uh, the other two op amps there might still have a second functionality. Then we have a, a 74HC4094. That's an 8-bit serial in parallel out shift register. So uh, they probably needed, um, uh, they didn't have enough uh, digital output pins available. So they expanded simply the that's my so, um, my guess. They expanded the uh, digital outputs of the microcontroller with the uh, 8-bit parallel out shift register. And then we have a again an analog multiplexer. Uh, this time it's a 74HC4051 here. That's an 8-channel uh, to one channel, uh, either multiplexer or demultiplexer. That means as with uh, all the CMOS uh, multiplexers, uh, they can be used in both directions. So you can either have eight inputs uh, selected to go to one output or the other way around. You um, use uh, one input and um, demultiplex it to one of eight available outputs. So here I think they are um, just selecting um, the, or they are distributing the uh, digital to analog, uh, uh, the result of the digital to analog converter to 
uh, here these three switches, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, if you think it's worthwhile to make a full reverse engineering of the analog part, just leave a note in the comments, then I will take a closer look and make a real uh, deep reverse engineering how they, how all the analog circuitry is hanging together. So anyway, a next import or last important um, uh, part of the analog circuitry are these uh, three ICs. They are the industry standard DG442. These uh, integrated in these are four normally open switches, uh, again analog switches. So you might ask, well, well, in the other testers, they uh, they use uh, the uh, again the CMOS HC4051, 52, or 53. Why do they use here the uh, more expensive DG442? Uh, well, I think the reason is uh, these go up to uh, 30 volts uh, input voltage. And uh, that might be the reason, perhaps also because they have a very or reasonably low RDS on, so the on resistance of the switches, but not much lower than the uh, HC4051, 52, 53. So I think it's more the um, uh, that they can. Uh, switch up to 30 volts, so we have only 12 volt present here. Um, that might be the reason. Anyway, um, these are again um, the central switches to switch as well the uh, the analog uh, input voltages generated from the digital to analog converter to one or two of the different pins as well as switching the uh, uh, the input voltages from the pins uh, to th uh, the ADC inputs of the microcontroller. So uh, a bit more, or not a bit, a lot more analog circuitry um, than in the cheaper DCA55 as well as in the AS4002 Pro Determinator, but necessary for the functionality of curve tracing um, and, uh, and um, uh, mandatory just because to power it all with a single AAA cell, uh, you need at least two step up voltage converters, in this case, uh, of course, boost converters. So on the other side, there is uh, nothing more interesting. We have the uh, LCD. This is the uh, backlight for the LCD, two switches. And uh, what's still a bit interesting is here, we have apparently a, a uh, programming um, adapter, well, not pin header, but the pins for the uh, five pin uh, PIC programmer. Um, that's probably only used for the initial programming because um, with the internal bootloader it can be programmed over USB as I have already done here to uh, get the uh, newer, a newer firmware version. Um, but um, as with any uh, or most chips um, you have to first program a bootloader uh, into it before you can access the USB and then make a, a firmware upgrade over USB. So that shall be it for a uh, close and quick uh, look at the circuitry of the DCA75 Pro. What's my final verdict? Well, this one is the most expensive one. It gives uh, good or the best results concerning identifying semiconductors, the f extra functionality to identify and test three pin voltage regulators is more like a joke. I think it's unusable. 
Uh, they make relatively good use of the graphical LCD, but uh, with all the Peak Atlas uh, testers, or with both of the testers, um, what really annoys me is that uh, you always have to uh, use the scroll button to access the different uh, measured uh, parameters of your semiconductor. Uh, so I really can't understand uh, why they do not an automatically page-wise scrolling of, uh, of the LCD, at least software selectable. Uh, they could easily upgrade this uh, with a with a new new firmware, but um, apparently nobody except me has complained. And well, if you're content with this, um, it's uh, it's quite okay from the functionality. Again, with both both Peak Atlas. Uh, having only the three test clips is a little bit on the downside. So the test clips are nice. They are even gold-plated. Um, but I would like to see a, a, a separate three-pin uh, pin header for quickly inserting uh, three-pin transistors or, or two-pin um, um, through-hole LEDs, uh, etc. And... Uh, um, well, it's quite nice, but I think it's too expensive. And I won't say anything now about the curve tracing functionality. We will, as already mentioned, we will investigate this in a separate comparison with uh, a, a separate or dedicated uh, USB curve tracer as well with an analog curve tracer and then evaluate if the curve tracing functionality is really worthwhile, if it's, if it's really worth uh, the extra money you have to pay for it. Anyway, relatively nice design, much better than the DCA55, but still having a few uh, ergonomical disadvantages. Uh, some of them could easily be fixed with a firmware upgrade. Um, anyway, it's, I would give it a thumbs in the middle, not thumbs up, not thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. So that was it for the DCA75. So for a final look here we have all four together again. In my opinion, which is of course as any opinion always biased a little bit, these are the best one. They have the best usability. Uh, this one is, in my eyes, totally crap. Um, too expensive uh, for uh, bad usability. This one here is uh, relatively usable, um, relatively versatile, but too much on the high side concerning the price. And so you know what my recommendation is, get one of these.